And patriotism was at a high, I mean, a, maybe close to an all-time high, maybe only World War II would have been better. And they said, we think it is a great time for a very patriotic character. So would you consider putting on a red, white, and blue mask, red, white, and blue tight, tights, red, white, and blue trunks, red, white, and blue boots, and calling yourself a patriot? I said, man, I'm willing to try anything. I'll do it. And that night, they had the outfit with them. They had already planned this all out. That night, when I walked through that curtain in Dallas, Texas, to that crowd of thousands of people, they had never seen that character before. This was the first night that character had ever come through those curtains. And the place exploded. That's how patriotism was at that point. People, everybody was in love with America. And it exploded. And it took my career to places I never thought it would go. At every stop in my career, the AWA, the GWF, I worked for the largest wrestling company in Japan for close to six years. WCW, the WWF, which is now WWE. But at every stop in my 14-year career, I was one of the top guys in that company. And because of that character, and maybe what limited ability I had, had a great career. But along the way, again, that separation from me and the Lord, I had let that sin get into my life. And guys, I know a lot of us watch pro wrestling. I've always watched it. I still follow it from afar. Everybody I've wrestled with has died or retired or no longer in the business, but I still occasionally tune in. But let me tell you, it is a wicked industry. It's like being in a rock band. You work at night in front of thousands and thousands of people, and then when you're done, you're out on the town and you're exposed to every rotten, sinful thing that there is. Alcohol, women, drugs. It's horrible. And I fell victim to that lifestyle. Started having some injuries later in my career. And in an effort to try to prolong my career, I had a guy one night I was on the road with a guy named John Norton and Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning. And we were traveling together. And I was complaining of an elbow that just a few short months later would need surgery. And Kurt Henning asked me, he said, do you take anything for it? I said, yeah, I took a couple of Tylenol before the match. And he was in the front seat and he rolled around and he looked at me. He said, Tylenol? I said, yeah. He said, man, you need to take a, a couple of Percocets or a couple of Vicodins. And at that point in time, I thought if you took prescription narcotic pain medication, it would make you loopy and you couldn't go out and work. And I said, how can you work on that stuff? And he looked at me and he said, how can you work without it? Evidently, you haven't been in this industry too long. We spent over 300 nights a year on the road going worldwide. There was no seasonal break in that industry. So I took two pain pills that night from Kurt Heaney. Fast forward through my career, I kept having injuries and to try to prolong surgeries, to try to keep working through those injuries, to try to take advantage of the money I was making, the notoriety that I had. Again, the Bible says in Matthew, seek ye first the kingdom of God. But there were other things at that point in time in my life that were more important to me. Fame, fortune, being noticed, been able to walk into a nightclub and walk out with any woman I wanted to, or people patting me on the back, buying me drinks, taking me to the bathroom and shoving my nose full of cocaine. Those two pills, a few short years later, turned into 120 prescription pain pills a day. A horrible, horrible addiction that cut short my career, cost me my family, cost me my finances, and eventually cost me my freedom. When every doctor I knew would no longer write me prescriptions for pain pills, I learned how to call them in myself. I became the doctor. I could get a doctor's DEA number, call in, I knew exactly what to say, the terminology, how to phrase it, to use that DEA number, which is basically a doctor's social security number. And over the course of probably about four years, I was arrested close to 30 times for forging prescription pain medication. Went through four rehabs. Again, I would stress to you, seek ye first the kingdom of God. But that became very unimportant to Bill Wilkes. There were other things that were much more important in my life than that. There's nothing wrong with being an athlete. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. I encourage it for all you young men. It can teach you a lot. But again, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Finally, after four stints in rehab, my wife at the time took the kids and left. I went home one day to a big old empty house. I was soon an ex-husband, a part-time father, 
I had been placed on probation time and time and time again. I kept getting chance time and time again only because of what name recognition I had. Former Gamecock All-American, former professional wrestler. Finally, after close to 30 arrests, I went before a judge. I had been before several times before. He said, Mr. Wilkes, there's nothing I can do for you. I've put you on probation. I've extended the probation. I've intensified the probation. I've sent you to rehab. He said, I've got no choice but to sentence you to 18 months in the South Carolina Department of Corrections. Gentlemen, this was not going to be an overnight stay at the county detention center. This was going to be 18 months in prison. With good behavior, I did close to a year and got out. But it took that in a prison in Aiken, South Carolina, for me to realize I had played the fool. What an idiot. Most important thing in my life at one time as a young man who had been serving the Lord. And I thank God for that perfect salvation that even when we do stray, we're still saved. Yes. Now God's going to punish yes. me. And God's forgiven me. He straightened my life out. I have been drug free for years now. The Lord's put my life back together. I can make, take no credit for it. It's all been through the grace and the mercy of God. I sat down not long ago, maybe a couple of years ago, and I wrote down the name of every guy in professional wrestling that I could think of, that I had wrestled with, that I knew. I'd had in my home. I'd been in their home. I knew their wives. I knew their kids. We worked for the same companies of those that had died, and it was over 60. And the overwhelming majority of them were in their 30s and 40s. The same thing that God spared my life from took their life. So I stand here tonight truly, truly a recipient of God's amazing grace and a forgiving God and a loving God and a God of a second chance. And I would urge you to never make that mistake. There are several of you young men around here, even if you're older. God forgave me and He has forgiven me. He gave me a new life. He restored that joy of salvation to me. But guess what? Those scars will never go away. When they bury Del Wilkes, he will be buried as a felon. He will be buried as an ex-convict, an ex-husband, a father who went from staying under the same roof with his kids all the time to barely seeing his kids for a long period of time. But again, God's matchless grace was so sufficient to me. And I can never do enough for him. Never. I'll never measure up. But the least I can do is serve him. And I would urge you to do the same thing. I would assume that most of you here tonight know the Lord. You're saved. And fellas, listen. It's time that men like us, we take a stand. We don't back down. We know how this thing's going to end. This Bible tells us this here. We, we're on the winning side, guys. And we know how it's going to end. But under the current climate which we live in, I'd honestly think things are going to get rough for us. I don't think I've ever seen a time in my life where it's more hostile toward Christian people than it is right now. And I didn't come here to get political tonight. That's not my job. That's not what I'm here for. But we've never seen anything like what we're seeing now. What used to be wrong is right. right. What used to be right is wrong. Christian people are mocked. They're made fun of. Guys, the world doesn't get us. They never have and they never will. But you know, it gives me great pride every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night when I'm in my home church in KC, South Carolina. I look around and I see men of God that I've known for 10, 15, 20 years, some of them over 40 years. They got saved back when my dad got saved back in the 60s. And they may be quiet, they may be unassuming, they're not loud, they're not braggadocious, they're not in your face, but they're men of character, spiritual character. They serve a great God. And they're not afraid to take a stand. And we need to take a stand. Our country's in the condition that it's in today because good men have stood by and said nothing. That's right. Gentlemen, we can do it. And we can do it in love and compassion with a kind heart, a compassionate heart. But we've got to stand. We've got to be men of character. We've got to be men that separates ourselves from this world. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. And we've got to live in this world. And you don't have to brag about what a great Christian you are. They'll see it by your walk. Yes. And you can claim to be a Christian, but if you dress like the world, you walk like the world, you talk like the world, you go where the world's go, the world goes, you listen to what they listen to, and you watch what they watch, what kind of testimony can you have? You're no different than them. 
The Bible says we're to be a city set on a hill. We're a unique people. We're called to be set apart. And I challenge each and every one of you that, to do that. From this day forward, and I'm sure many of you are, but never forget that we're on the winning side and we don't have to take a back seat to anybody. We don't have to back down. This is what we live our lives by. Just a few weeks ago at work, everybody knows that I'm a Christian there. I don't walk around thumping my Bible or thumping my chest about it. I try to let my actions be loud for me. And the subject of gay marriage came up with some of the guys, and they were trying to bait me into the conversation a couple of the guys were. And one of them wheeled around and looked at me. He said, I don't know how you feel about it. He said, who are you to judge? I said, buddy, I haven't judged it. God's judged it. That's right. And we've got to align ourselves with that. Yes. And these things in here that we know to be true, the Lord has given us to guide our steps and to guide our lives. And I challenge each and every one of us to be better men, better godly men, better Christians. And for you young guys, it's not worth it. Don't make the mistakes that I did. Don't go down the path that I did. You may not survive it. And if you do come out the other side, there will be scars of sin that will you, you will carry with you the rest of your life. He's a forgiving God. He forgave David for what he did with Bathsheba. But David's family was a mess till the day he died. And if there's any of you here tonight that don't know the Lord, and you're not saved, I would beg you. If you miss me tonight, you have missed nobody. You've missed nothing. But if you miss him, you've missed it all. And it's not by works. We can't work ourselves into heaven. There's nothing good that I could do to get there. It's only through that wonderful sacrifice that was made, through accepting Him as your personal Lord and Savior. And I can say this, very fortunate. I was a consensus All-American at the University of South Carolina. I was team captain, team MVP. I had a very good career as a professional wrestler. The greatest thing I've ever done in my life is give my life to the Lord and serve Him. All that other stuff means absolutely nothing. It's great to be noticed from time to time and be recognized and they can't open some doors for you. But gentlemen, there's nothing like serving the Lord. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciate you uh, making me feel welcome. Pastor, I appreciate you having me. And uh, I've enjoyed it. God bless you.